Primes, but also on squares, and it is a kind of survey. Of course, there will be some recent and new results contained, but uh, there is a, it's the the flavor is a little bit of a survey and an introduction into the field a little. So I start with a, the most classical automatic sequence with the two Morse sequence, and this two Morse sequence uh, will also appear in the next talk by with Montgomery. Uh, actually, the problems that uh, we are studying go back to Gelfond, in some sense, in a paper in six, uh, uh, that is more than 40 years uh, old. Um, I will explain in detail what automatic sequences are, and I will put it into the framework of uh, what I call generalized two and more sequences. So there are several extensions of two and more sequences, and this is maybe a new one, uh, but or a new notation of this kind. So it's not. Uh, uh, it's a very uh, natural generalization, group theoretic generalizations, and of course I will speak on subsequences along squares and primes. So which is the actual topic of this talk. So the classical 2 and more sequence can be defined in several ways, you know, and uh, I think the one of the most easiest uh, description of the 2 and more sequence is a recursive one, that you start with 0, then append a 1, and then you just invert the sequence, so you replace 0 by 1, and 1 by 0, and then append. So zero one goes to one zero, and then you recursively apply this procedure. So you append now one zero zero one, and so on. And this gives the two or more sequence. So and it can be recursively defined in this way. This is just the construction, or already from this recurrence, you can see that it's closely related to the binary sum of digits function. So if you consider the binary expansion of an integer, so q equals 2, then the su binary sum of digits function is just the sum of digits or the number of powers of 2 that you need to represent n. And if you distinguish between an odd and even case, so if the sum of digits is even, then, then it, this is exactly the case where the two or more sequence is 0, and if it's odd, then the two more sequence gets one. So, the sum of digits function is closely related to the two Morse sequence. So, the two Morse sequence has many, many interesting properties. I just mentioned here a few of them. So, it's non-periodic and Q-plus, which means that, so for example, there is no block consecutive blocks of one 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 or zero 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 or one zero one zero one zero will never appear there. Um, it's almost periodic, so th this means that every appearing consecutive blocks appears infinitely many times in this sequence with bounded gaps. Um, the subword complexity is is linear or sublinear, so it's bounded by constant times k, which is and the subword complexity is just the number of different consecutive blocks of length k. So this means that the um, the two or more sequence is far away from being a random sequence. So a random sequence definitely has a subword complexity of the form 2 to the k, because every subblock has to appear there of length k. And this uh, shows that the corresponding topological entropy that appears uh, in the talk yesterday is zero. Because, so it's a um, deterministic sequence in this sense. And linear subsequences have the same property, by the way, and uh, the two Morse sequence and all their linear subsequences are automatic sequences. So this is the automaton related, or it, uh, one of the possible automata that is related to a two Morse sequence. So I will come back to this automata later. So this is, you certainly know this kind of automaton. 
So the topic of the talk is to the study subsequences of automatic sequences. So let's start with subsequence of the two and more sequence. Um, but before I, I, before this, I want to make a very, very easy observation, namely that in the two and more sequence, the uh, density of the digits zero and one are equally. Um, uh, right, of just one half, so that are the same. So this means that zero and one appear with the same frequency, and this is very easy to observe uh, because if you start with zero one, then you get one zero and so on. So you see that the number of zeros and ones so are almost the same. So there's just a difference of one at most. So so the asymptotic frequency that zero appears and also that of one is one half, and so this is a kind of uniform distribution result, which is very easy in this case. But it gets more interesting if you consider subsequences. For example, if I take just a linear subsequence of the multiples of three, so then actually the same result holds. So of course, uh, this is follows from a general result, but you if you start looking at the sequence you would not expect that but it is already it's actually true that if you consider any linear subsequence of the two or more sequence then the asymptotic, the asymptotic frequency of zeros and ones is again one half so it's again uniformly distributed um, but, but linear subsequence are in some sense easy because you again get an automatic sequence and then you know something about the frequencies, etc. Uh, it gets much more difficult if you, and of course much more interesting if you consider, for example, the subsequence of primes. So two, the second, third, fifth, seventh and so on. Then the sequence is of course not that deterministic as before, and this was a conjecture by Gelfond and was proved recently by Modi and Rivard that if, no, if you now consider the asymptotic frequencies of zeros and ones in this sequence, then there are again one half. So zeros and ones appear with the same frequency in this subsequence. So you get again a uniform distribution result for zeros and ones in this subsequence. Okay, make it a little bit easier in some sense, or you can. But uh, what is easy in this sense? So, so there are many primes, but there are only few squares. So, if you consider the subsequence of squares, so zero, one, four, nine, and so on, then you, it again, was shown by Modui and Rivard, uh, again by a solution of a problem by Gelfond that. 0 and 1 appear with the same frequency, one half. Uh, so this, uh, it was in some sense more difficult because of the primes because there are much more primes than squares. So this was one of the difficulties. But anyway, you could ask more on this subsequence and actually last year we could show that this subsequence of the two and more sequence is far away from being deterministic, but it looks, it is a random sequence in, this, in, the, in the sense that it's a normal sequence. Even if it doesn't look random, so it's 0, 1, 0, zero, one, one, zero one, 1, and so on at the beginning, but actually it is a normal sequence. So every block, so the block 1, 1, one, so you don't see the block one, 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 but it will appear with the frequency one over eight, and every other block. So this, uh, this actually, this this was not easy, but this, uh, from at least from our point of view, this was uh, even more difficult to prove. Things that have been easy in some sense in this problem uh turned out to be very very difficult in this context so this is not a, a we at least from our point of view it's not a direct generalization of this result 
So uh, what is nice f from our point of view is also that you start with a deterministic sequence with the two and more sequence, and by just taking out the squares, the subsequence of squares, you get uh, something that behaves randomly. Okay, so I mentioned Gelfond uh, several times in the beginning of the talk, so what is his, his contribution on, in this uh, context? So this is this paper in Acta Arithmetica where he considered the sum of digits uh, along a linear subsequence, modulo m. So it's, for example, the two and more the sequence along a linear subsequence. So if it's binary and mod 2. So and he proved under mild condition that you get a uniform distribution result. So that uh, if you consider the sequence, the sum of digits mod m, take a linear subsequence, then this sequence is uniformly distributed on the set 0 up to uh, q minus 1, or m minus 1, I'm sorry. So, uh, and this holds for all linear subsequence. So, for example, that if you consider the two and more sequence along a linear subsequence, you get the uniform distribution result. So, linear subsequences uh, can be done very generally and uh, this is from nowadays this is an exercise uh, but what was more important uh, Gelfond posed three problems the first problem that he posed is uh, concerning the distribution of uh, a joint uh, of two joint or several jo sequences if you consider different bases co prime bases two three five or whatever and consider the d-dimensional sequence and he conjectured that this theta dimensional sequence, if you take, of course, again, uh, modular M1, M2, and so on, that this behaves uniformly distributed. And it, and it turned out that it is. There was a pre-version pre of this result without error term by Bezino. And this, in 99, it was finally proved. The second conjecture was on prime. So if you consider uh, the subsequence prime, and the conjecture of Gelfand was that it's again uniformly distributed, and this was solved by Modin and Rivard in 2010, that was published in 2010. And the third conjecture was on polynomial subsequence, so if, for example, the squares or the cubes. So for the squares, it was proved by Modin and Rivard. This, all this, both this contribution were already mentioned for the two Mose sequence. So it turned out that for higher polynomials, polynomials of higher degree, this is very, very, or at least we cannot do it, or we can only we can have only a partial solution for uh, polynomials of higher degree uh, if the basis is sufficiently large. So if, for example, if the degree is three, then I think the base should be at least 700 or something. So it's, and this grows very, very quickly. Anyway, uh, it, 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 uh, it indicates that this conjecture should be true, even if it's not completely proven now. Uh, which input data? Yeah. Um, it's. I think it's universal in the, in the, for the linear subsequence. <laughs> okay. So, what is now a gen uh, automatic sequence? So this is uh, very basic, of course. What I'm doing here now. So uh, uh, you start with an automaton, a finite automaton, and the output of an automaton is a. Uh, automatic sequence when the input uh, of the automaton is a Q area expansion of an integer. So you are feeding uh, the automaton with the digits and then the automaton does something and the output is then an automatic sequence. So for example, this is an automaton with three states and um, I also used the Turner expansion, but this is not necessarily uh, should not be 
so the number of states could be any number, not, not necessarily related to the base. So, and what we are doing now, this is the starting initial state, so, and we are reading the digits. So you can do it from the left or from the right, so start from the left, so the first digit is one. So you are in this state, and then you look, and here you have an arrow with an labeled by one, and so you go to this next state, because the first digit is one, so the next uh, digit is zero, so you follow the next arrow, you go, you stay at this uh, state, and so on and so forth, and then Finally, you are, uh, you, if the input sequence is, is ends, then you're finally at this state, and then the automaton says that your output is A. And you could do this for any number, so it is, is clear. And uh, finally, you get something, and this is an automatic sequence. Uh, you can view it a little bit differently. So you have three states, and you have three transition matrices, that tell you what you're doing if your next input is zero, one, or two. And if you want to calculate your automatic sequence, you could do the following, that you use these matrices. You start with um, the vector one, zero, zero, and corresponding to the digit that come up, you multiply it by these matrices corresponding to the digits. So you multiply these matrices, and then uh, if you st uh, multiply this product of matrices to the vector of 1, 0, 0, you end up with 0, 1, uh, 0, and since the 1 gets to the second uh, uh, position, this corresponds that you end up in the second uh, state in the automaton, so this tells you uh, how the, uh, the automatic sequence behaves. So the product of these matrices encodes, in some sense, the automatic sequence. So what you can do formally is that you, your input are the digits of your integer, and then you just take the product of these matrices corresponding to, to the digits, and this is a sequence of matrices. If you multiply this with this vector, then you and apply some some functional, then you get the automatic sequence. So this is a, a possible definition of an automatic sequence. So I'm doing this because uh, this is closer related to this generalized notion of uh, two Morse sequence that I want to present to you. And um, I'm using also a very specific no notation. I cannot consider general automatic sequences, but uh, I will consider automatic sequence that we will call invertible in the sense that these three matrices are permutation matrices, so that these matrices are invertible and that this, the first one, M0, is the identity matrix. So it's special, but for example, for the two Morse sequence, this is satisfied, clearly. So look, maybe we should look a little to this automaton. So what does this automaton do? So you see if you get an input zero, then you stay. If you get the input one, then you go to the other state. So this means if you have, for example, three ones in your expansion, you go here, there, and back. So in general, if you have an odd number of ones, you will end up at this state. If you get an even number of ones in your expansion, you end up in that state. So this automaton uh, gives the, uh, the two Morse sequence. And this is an invertible automaton. Another famous uh, sequence, uh, automatic sequence, is the Rudin-Shapiro sequence. It turns out it's non-invertible. It can be also written in terms of the binary expansion. So what you are doing is to you count consecutive blocks of the form 0, 0, and if the number of blocks, uh, not 0, 0, 1, 1, and if the number of blocks, 1, 1 blocks, is even, then the rudin shapiro sequence is 0. If the number of consecutive 1, 1 blocks is even, then it's 1. So this is the corresponding automaton. 
And of course, um, if you take the sum of digits, mod m, this is an invertible automatic sequence. So, uh, what we can prove for this, this was a paper together with a former PhD student of mine, Johannes Morgenbesser, we could prove that if you have an invertible automatic sequence, and then, and we take this subsequence of squares, so then uh, the densities of each letter exist. So we have an isotonic frequency. It might be uniformly distributed or not. Uh, uh, what is not written in this theorem is that we can decide what is the frequency. So we, it, it, we can, it, it's, it exists and we can compute it. So it, we can decide if it's uniform, distributed or not. Of course, this generalizes the result of Modi and Rivard, uh, where they considered the special sequence. So this was the solution of the Gelfand problem of the sum of digits function mod m, and the subsequent squares was uniformly distributed in, and uh, this is a generalization of that. And what I already mentioned before is the result, together with Modorin Rivard, on the normality of these subsequences. We take the sp special sequence of the two and Morse sequence. So it's, it's not clear to us at the moment if this kind of result can be generalized to this setting or not, or to the root in Shapiro or whatever. So this is uh, not done at the moment. Nevertheless, uh, there are some other results. For, uh, very recent results by Modui and Riva says that if you take the Rudin Shapiro sequence that is not invertible, then and take the subsequent squares, you again get a uniform distribution there. So that is what is known at, as far as, as I know for squares. And of course, it would be interesting to uh, get rid of this um, strange, or you can say, let's call it strange assumption of an invertible. Uh, it, it, in, this, in, strong, in this strong sense, it, the, it would be false in general, but the conjecture is that if you consider a Q-automatic sequence, any Q-automatic sequence, then the logarithmic densities for each letter of the subsequence of squares should exist. So this is the natural conjecture. But, and of course, we are trying to get close to this. So there are quite related results to the squares. Of course, you can ask for cubes and so on. But it turns out cubes and uh, higher degree polynomials are quite difficult to study. So we can try to consider um, a polynomial of low degree less than two, so of course linear polynomials, or uh, sequences of the form n to the c, where c is between one and two. And of course we have to use the floor function then. So we again consider a, subs a kind of polynomial subsequence of an automatic sequence. And this is a result together with Jean-Marc Desoyer and Morgan Besser. Uh, we could prove that if we, uh, if the degree, say, is not too large, so it's larger than one, it's more than linear, but not uh, larger than 1.4, then it, it can be shown that uh, if, it is, if you have an automatic sequence, so it's a very, without being invertible, so it's a general automatic sequence, and if we have an asymptotic density of a letter in the, in the sequence, in the original sequence, then the, then the density of this subsequence is the same, exists and is the same for this letter, for all letters. So it, it is, a theorem indicates that there is, the, or there should be a relation between the densities of uh, original automatic sequence and the density of certain subsequence. So this is a general result for all automatic sequences. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot push this further. So it would be nice to get it for, for example, all non-integer exponents or something like this. It is con the conjecture is that it should be true. And this is the theorem that we uh, already mentioned for higher degrees. So here we have 
or a restriction that the, oh, this should be a D. So this, if uh, the base is large enough, for, then we get for this special uh, sequence a uniform distribution result. So the situation for primes is um, almost at the same level as for squares. So uh, this is a new result. If you take a invertible automatic sequence, then f and, the subsequ and you consider the subsequence of primes, then it can be shown that the density for each letter exists. So, and it can be computed. It can be decided if it is uniform or not. So this generalizes the result of, of Modu and Riva for the sum of digits function mod m, which was the solution of the Gelfand problem. And again, a very recent result by Moduri and Riva is that if you consider the Rudin Shapiro sequence, this is really a very nice result. Uh, that if you consider the subsequence of primes, then you again have that the density of zero and one is one half. Well, uh, uh, this sequence is not invertible, so it's not contained here. So and and they can also do it for some generalized routine Shapiro sequences. So, but the, uh, again, the problem uh, is: can you do more on that? What is about uh, general automatic sequences. Uh, what is not known, and this is maybe out of reach, is to prove something like a normality result of the subsequent of primes. Of course, it's very difficult to consider s s consecutive primes. Okay, so it's quite natural not to do this. So, um, what is now the context of this invertible? Uh, automatic sequences and uh, why do we need or in the ter this strange condition of invertible matrices? It turned out that there is a natural con group theoretic context. So uh, let's, let's be in a compact group and and consider some given elements. Q is against the base, say, and you consider just specific elements in this group and G, so the group G that where we will really work should be the closure of the subgroup that is generated by these elements. So this again a compact group. And starting from the quadratic expansion, uh, I define or we define a generalized to a more sequence. Of course there might be other definitions of generalizations just by mimicking the construction of the two and more sequence, so this is now written in the uh, as a product, so in the, the sum of digits it's a sum, but you just uh, consider the digits and you take the product according to these digits where you just make a product of these group elements here, where these group elements are given. This is the same as a Q-multiplicative function. Uh, so this is a, a notion that, is, that appears in the literature. So, uh, of course, this generalized the two and more sequence. If I consider this simple group, base two, these two elements in this group, then this is just a two and more sequence. Of course, you get the sum of digits, mod m, and you also get uh, this sequence alpha times the sum of digits function mod 1, then the group is the torus. Uh, these are all examples where the group is um, a, a community, so a billion group. So, but of course, this concept also applies to non abelian groups. And what is the relation to automatic sequence? The, if you have an invertible automatic sequence, then you can write this invertible automatic sequence as a function of a generalized to a Morse sequence because you have invertible matrices, so you uh, in a, gr a, mat uh, a group of matrices times a vector. So if we can def show something on this generalized to a Morse sequence, then 
it directly follows some uh, something. It follows a kind of distribution result for invertible automatic sequence. So the focus is now to consider this kind of generalized to a most sequence on in this group setting, and to get some uniform distribution results. And uh, the first theorem that I am stating here, this is probably well known, but I don't know who was the first who stated that, that if you consider uh, this uh, to a more generalized to a Morse sequence, then it's uniformly distributed in this group G. So you get, uh, so that uh, if, if you normalize the, this discrete measure on the sequence, so this converges to the Ha measure. Or if you uh, take functionals, you can write it also in this way. Uh, what is now more interesting is to consider subsequence. If we consider this group setting and this generalized to a Morse sequence, and we consider a linear subsequence, it turns out that this normalized discrete measure converges again, but not necessarily to the uniform or to the uh, to the Ha measure, but to some measure that is related to the Ha measure. There is a subgroup you consider co uh, 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 the um, cosets of the subgroup, and on these cosets, it's it's uh, a copy more or less of the of the of the harm measure and this is co but uh, you have to weight these copies with a little and so on but it is on, on it's a measure that you can explicitly state so but it's not necessarily uniformly distributed the same happens for squares and this is the more interesting point so if you consider uh, this generalized to a Morse sequence then again uh, and the subsequent squares then the the normalized discrete measure converges to some measure that is related to the Ha measure, and you can explicitly put it. And for the same holds for primes. Again, there is a limiting measure related to the Ha measure, and you can uh, decide how it looks like. So this is these are the results. So how to prove these results and if you're in a group setting, you can do it with group representations. And uh, the point is this lemma that you can, uh, if you have, a, um, the, uh, the, if you have a sequence in the group, if this is uniformly distributed or distributed according to a measure new, then you can check. Uh, this convergence just by checking it with the help of group representation. So this is what is the uh, generalization of the while criterion in the uniform distribution model one setting. So this is this you can find this condition, for example, in the book of Kuipers and Niederreiter. So there are some exceptional uh, representations, irreducible representations, or so actually these are uh, one-dimensional exceptions, so characters of specific form, and this, uh, this uh, specific uh, characters gives rise to the non-uniform uh, distribution, so you, that, it, that the measure, the, or the limiting measure is not the Ha measure, but something related to the Ha measure, and the others, so the other measures. So I don't want to get into the, too much into the detail to this, um, but what how what is a main ingredient for this is a free term. Uh, uh, the free term is the following: that you consider your two and more sequence and you cut it off at some level. So you consider only the first lambda digits and the other digits you neglect. So this is a new sequence that you get from the original sequence, but you only consider the first lambda digits. This sequence is then, of course, periodic with period Q to the lambda, 
and so you can define a kind of free term. So of course this is the, the representation of the sequence then and the discrete free transform of that. Uh, and this is was actually uh, the main ingredients or that has been invented by Modu and Renoir in order to show or the, the conjectures or to, to solve the conjectures by Gelfond. And this is a generalization of this concept. And what you really need for these free terms is a uniform upper bound. So in this context, it factors in a quite simple way. And it, it turns out that if you combine two of these factors, then the product of two these factors uh, gives some saving, so it's not non-trivial. So it follows that you get an uniform exponential upper bound for these Fourier terms, and this is the main thing that you need for the proof. Not only one of the main things, so but you need this. So I cannot. Uh, go too much into detail to the proof, but uh, how can you use this free term? What you, for example, for the linear subsequence, you just make a easy free analysis, discrete free analysis, and what you get is a sum where you have these free terms times a simple exponential sum. Okay, and if you want to estimate this, you get that. So, and you see, for example, if h is zero then you, this exponential sum gets trivial, but then you need some exponential estimate for this Fourier term. And so you get a non-trivial estimate. So for the squares, it's a little bit more involved. Uh, I don't go too much, again, not too much in the detail, but what you here, the second main ingredient is to use a van der Korput inequality so that you relate the original sum to a sum of differences in the exponent. This also applies here. And the point is that if you consider n square and n plus r square, so the, if r is small compared to n, then the leading digits will be the same here and there. So this means that if you consider this part here, then uh, this part will cancel, so that that this part here, if you take the whole sequence, uh, pulls down to something where you can restrict to only to the first lambda digits. And then you again do a, f a free analysis as an, and so on. Uh, here, uh, it's important that lambda is much smaller than, so that you really get something that uh, where you can work with. Actually, you have to do a second uh, cutting of digits from, from, the, from below to get a nice result. But I can, uh, so I will skip this. But actually, you, this is the, the, the main two ingredients, these three terms times uh, cutting off digits. So I skip this. And for primes, you do a similar procedure. Uh, what you're doing is you use a uh, variation of Warren's method. So if you want to know something on that, you can do, do uh, sums of or sums of type one and type two. And here you don't see primes anymore. And this part here can be analyzed again by using a van der Korput method to cut off digits. Actually, you have to do it twice. And by using the estimates for the free term, you finally get the results. So this is a very short version of the work they did. But these are the main ingredients. This estimate of the free term and using van der Korp type inequalities to cut off digits and a subtle free analysis. So I'm hiding all the details here, so what they did. But the nice thing is you can uh, adapt uh, the methods of Modéry and Riva more or less very easily to this generalized version of the two Morse sequence. Um, maybe some two remarks, or some additional remarks. So uh, I already mentioned the, the problem on the normality of the subsequence of squares of the two Morse sequence. 
So what is the problem there? There are several problems, but the main problem to, for proving this was uh, to get an, a uniform upper bound for a Fourier term. And if you, here we couldn't use these simple Fourier terms, but we had to use a Fourier term where we had uh, this here the sum of digits function, uh, the cut digits function, not only at one uh, uh, value, but on a linear subsequence of length k. And the, the most difficult point there or in the proof was, or the main ingredient of the proof was to get a uniform upper bound of this free term, which is very easy to get if you just look at uh, one point. So I mentioned this before, so this lemma, This lemma here. So this is quite easy to get because you have this product representation and you just combine two of them and so on. So this is on the level of a nice exercise. But here in for the normality question of normality, it's much more than this. And this actually, it, this was the for at least from my point of view the most difficult part of this proof. So things that are relatively simple and relatively simple for the uh, condition that you easily get in the first case uh, much more difficult here and so it's not clear to us at the moment how to generalize this for example to the more general setting of invertible uh, automatic sequences and and a final remark is that you can get rid of this mod m in some sense. So if you consider, for example, the sum of digits function mod m, of course you're losing something. You're just considering the, mod, uh, the residue class mod m, but the methods be, that are used here, are, and all of them are analytic, so you can get a little bit more if you look more precisely. So what you can, you can actually get something on the number of primes such that the sum of digits function of these primes is not in a residue class mod m, but is some integer k. So of course this uh, asymptotics is not valid for all k, so it would be, for example, quite interesting to get something for k equals 2, so, uh, and base 2, so if, yeah, Fermat primes. But this is far away from <laughs> that what we can do. We can do it for a range of k, which is some sense expected. So, uh, of course, the sum of digits function has an expected value, and if k is close to this expected value, we get some asymptotics. And if we, uh, for example, do this for the binary expansion, we and we specialize this result, we get the following asymptotics: uh, the number of primes up to four to the k, such that the sum of digits function x equals k. So if we consider numbers of this size, the expected size of the sum of digits function is k, approximately. So this is why this 4 to the k appears here. So this is asymptotically 4 to the k divided by k to the 3 halves times the constant. So, um, so actually there are several of them. So in particular we get a corollary that for a sufficiently large positive integers k, there always exists a prime number uh, such that the sum of digits function equals k. So, and of course, we did not do that uh, f first, finitely many of them. So, but actually, we could do this if we uh, invest some time. So, uh, it's very likely that for every k there exists a prime. Okay, so you can with these methods we can do a little more on that. So, thanks for your attention.